Welcome, WHU Otto Beisheim School of Management. I will start time as soon as a member of your team begins speaking. You will receive a one minute warning and time will end precisely at 10 minutes. Please feel free to begin. Dear audience, one welcome to the presentation of VO's results of the CFA Institute Research Challenge on TeamView. TeamView is a German, globally operating software as a service company with a comprehensive power portfolio targeting a broad variety of different industries and markets. For the most part, however, TeamView focuses on providing cross industry uh, services with cross industry use cases. Four out of eight of TeamView's products currently do not target a specific industry, but are rather for general usage. In this category is also Xalion, one of the three acquisitions TeamView has made so far, with the other two, Upskill and Ubimax, focusing on the augmented reality space. TeamView has been incredibly successful, particularly in recent years. Since 2018, TeamView has increased its quarterly revenues by 46%. This is largely due to TeamView's successful strategy, which relies on three core pillars. TeamView aims to expand its power portfolio continuously, to tackle the enterprise market, and to focus on new international markets. Finally, TeamView also constantly monitors potential M&A candidates. With Ubimax, it has made its first major acquisition in 2020. And although TeamView argues it focuses on its organic growth, acquisitions seem to play an ever more important role for the company, having made two in 2021 already. Overall, we would like to issue a buy recommendation for TeamView with a target price of 46 euros and 60 cents. This is equal to an upside of over 25%. Our decision is based primarily on three reasons. TeamView's strong growth potential across many different software services, its untapped potential in many international market, markets, and its fine, promising financial performance and strategic direction. That being said, I would like to hand it over to my colleague, Philip. Thanks. One reason for issuing a buy recommendation is that TeamView is operating in the rapidly growing SaaS industry. For different segments, we have projected compound annual growth rates in a range between 12 and 35%. Thereby, augmented reality stands out with a particularly high growth rate. Since, as we have already heard, TeamView has increased its AI exposure by acquisitions, we believe that the market has not yet fully incorporated this additional growth potential. Moreover, we expect that COVID-19 has fostered profound and long-lasting shifts toward digitalization across industries, providing a solid basis for revenue growth. Considering TeamView's geographical revenue split, we can see that currently only a minor share of sales result from APEC. However, TeamView has demonstrated that growth in APEC clearly outweighed that of other regions. Moreover, APEC offers the largest market in terms of overall size, growth, and spending on digital transformations. While we are aware that the competitive landscape and regulatory environment in APEC pose challenges for TeamView, we still believe that the growth potential in APEC is not yet fully captured in TeamView's valuation. To properly examine TeamViewer's competitive positioning, we distinguish three clusters. On the left, you can see TeamViewer's most similar peers in size and business activity. In this comparison, TeamViewer stands out by a comparatively high EBIT margin given expected revenue growth. In the middle, TeamViewer is compared to smaller, more specialized competitors. In this clustering, TeamViewer differentiates itself by relatively high revenue given still limited headcount. Finally, the right graph depicts TeamViewer and global SaaS providers. Although TeamViewer's size is certainly not comparable yet, Past rapid sales growth indicate that the firm slowly catches up. To summarize on the industry assessment, we conclude that TeamView is well positioned to capture attractive shares in rapidly growing markets, whereby particularly the growth potential of augmented reality, COVID-19, and APEC seem not yet fully captured in the valuation. And with that, I hand it over to Sufian in the financial analysis. Mute. Thanks, Philip. In terms of the financials, we believe TeamView will have a strong performance in the next five years mainly driven by high revenue growth, improved margins, as well as lower liquidity risk. Looking at revenues, we forecast a 22% CAGR with even stronger growth in operating and free cash flow. This is mainly driven by the expansion in APAC and Americas, them being new markets with significant upside, as well as improvements in the capital structure. Furthermore, a significant reduction in debt and subsequent interest payments is forecasted. For example, in 2019, the debt to equity ratio was over six, which is forecasted to be less than one in 2021. Looking at the gross operating and net margins, they're forecasted to improve. This is due to economies of scale, team viewer being a low marginal cost business model, as well as technological progress with advances in AI and automation, improving efficiency without the extra personnel costs. And personnel costs are among the biggest cost buckets for team viewer. 
Looking at Teamware's net margin bridge, we forecast that the net margin will increase from 30% in 2020 to 37% in 2025. This is mainly driven by the improvements in SG&A. However, we see that R&D spend is forecasted to increase over the next years. And this is important for Teamware to stay competitive and keep on innovating. Finally, given the factors above, such as increasing margins, hence cash flows, as well as lower debt, we project lower liquidity risk with current and cash ratio going above one by 2023. However, we have to keep in mind that Teamware, being a growth-oriented tech company, will reinvest the excess cash flows in M&A activity, among others, as it already has done with two major acquisitions so far this year. Due to this, the cash and current ratio will not go significantly above two. And with this, I would hand over for the ESG part. Thank you, Sophia. To incorporate existing ESG research, we made use of the MSCI ESG ratings methodology to better understand and evaluate TeamViewer's ESG risks and opportunities. Also, we applied MSCI's ESG industry materiality map, which helps to identify and weigh key ESG issues within the application software industry. And by doing so, we concluded an overall score of 7.4 out of 10 for TeamViewer's ESG rating. This score categorizes TeamViewer as a company that is a leader in its industry in addressing challenging environmental, social, and governance criteria. Just to name two examples here, as mentioned on the slide. Looking at the environmental aspect, TeamViewer is operating on a carbon neutral level since 2018. On the other side, TeamViewer significantly lacks diversity on the supervisory board and the senior leadership team due to a lack of female representation. In addition to that, TeamViewer has recently issued an ESG-related 300 million euro bond, thereby further incentivizing the firm to increase ESG efforts. And now Ananta continues with the valuation part. Our target price of 46.6 euros was achieved through a weighted average of two valuation methodologies, the DCF and the comparable company analysis method, with the majority weightage of 80% being assigned to the DCF, as we believe that it is a more accurate measure of the true value of TeamViewer due to a lack of a truly suitable peer group. In the DCF valuation, we use both the perpetuity growth rate and exit multiple method based on the EV EBITDA trading multiple for the terminal value calculation. With regards to the other key DCF inputs, I will discuss them in the following slide. For the comparable company analysis, we assign the EV EBITDA forward multiple with the majority weightage of 70% as we feel it is the most relevant multiple because the software industry is a less capital intensive business and the multiple has relatively limited exposure to accounting differences, which is an important factor considering our peer group. Regarding the key DCF inputs, the 3.91% perpetuity growth rate is based on the weighted average of the average inflation rate, the GDP growth rate of the various operating regions of TeamViewer, TeamViewer's expected industry growth rates, and a regression analysis forecasting the terms, firm's long-term growth rate. TeamViewer's WAC of 7.69% was calculated using a cost of debt of 3.9% and cost of equity of 11.1% derived using the CAPM model. We also carried out a sensitivity analysis for the key DCF inputs, namely terminal growth rate and WAG, to see how the stock price changes based on these inputs. Finalizing the valuation, we conducted a multicolor analysis to test our buy recommendation to incorporate uncertainty. We did so by normally distributing the input variables, revenue, and cost of goods sold growth, as well as WAG and terminal growth rate figures. Our analysis showed that in 65% of conducted simulations, the implied share price is above our buy recommendation. Hence, we assume that our recommendation is reasonable. Next, Nicholas will continue with the investment risk and finish our presentation. Thank you, Nata. When analyzing possible investment risk, we categorize four different risk classes. Business and operating risk, market risk, regulatory risk, including governance risk and the ownership structure, and legal risk. We assess the products and security threats, as well as industry competition pressures, are the most threatening risks due to high probability of happening and significant potential impact. However, we believe the team feels well positioned to tackle these challenges and risks. And finally, summarizing our investment thesis, we once more want to emphasize team feels potential for acquisitions, growing exposure to AR, low risk in combination with strong ESG potential, and the lasting and profound impact of COVID on the markets and the firm. Hence, we believe the firm is undervalued and we issue a buy recommendation for TeamViewer's stock. 
with a corresponding target price of 46.6 euros. Many thanks for your time and looking forward to your questions. Thank you. Judges, please turn on your video. I will start time as soon as a judge asks the first question. Time will end at 10 minutes. Please feel free to begin. Uh, Tai team, this is Simon. Uh, great work. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, first question that I have, um, referring to uh, your geographic expansion, uh, you refer to that uh, the, the size in terms of the, 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 the market of APEC is small, but you also recognize that, that there's, there's substantial growth opportunity in APEC uh, at the bottom part of this slide number six that I'm looking at. What do you think the company is, 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 is sort of missing uh, that, that they are not putting in to grow this part of the region over the last couple of years? Why is it, why, why is it identifying the growth future, but why has it been done by the company? Mm -hmm. I'm, I can kick it off this question. So we know TeamViewer is a relatively young company. They are just a few years on the stock exchange yet. So they are still rapidly growing. And as they are coming from a German origin in the center of Europe, they are currently, they started with, to work in mainly in the EMEA region in Europe and in Americas because the markets are more familiar. And it took more time and additional efforts to first develop their products and then go one step further to the APEC region and hence, we see that currently the share is still limited, but we'll expect them uh, to grow this over time. Can you further expand a little bit on, uh, so how do, you, how do you foresee the company will be growing into this region? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Obviously, um, well, definitely there is um, team view of, one of team view's core pillars is to focus on organic growth. Nevertheless, we have seen that, especially in recent years, TeamViewer has added many acquisition to its portfolio. And we believe due to the difficulties also in the market, it will also be beneficial in APAC to make use of acquisition to, um, to accelerate growth. And we, and we see from, from the intention of the company as well, that the headcount that they're growing in the APAC region uh, far outweighs that of other regions. It's over 60% in APAC versus less than 50% for, for the other regions. And, and that's for now, that's mostly in the, in the sales offices, while the research and development, they're still mostly focusing on EMEA. So, but I think with the internationality that's going on, this will also help with their expansion in, in APAC. Thank you guys uh, for the wonderful uh, research and presentation. This is Yishin uh, from PGM. Um, so here, my question is on slide four, you show the, the, the historical price um, and your target price, right? So can you um, tell me a little bit more as to why this firm has not been able to um, break out before it's underperforming recently, the, its peers, right, the tech index? Um, it's, um, why, I mean, it's been around that, you know, kind of, uh, index level, um, throughout the time period you're showing over the last couple of years, it looks like. So what is the market missing? Why is it not, um, uh, performing already? Mm -hmm. So one thing we have to keep in mind is as this is last 12 months is, is the period where they were extremely active in terms of news, in terms of. Um, almost three acquisitions that they did, as well as signing two two big deals of with Manchester United, which was 46 million uh, euros, which which was 10 percent of their the 2020 net sales. So there's a lot of uncertainty that that is taken into account here. Um, that that the market is not sure how the acquisitions will turn out, and also recently being IPO'd, the the market doesn't quite know what to expect. So therefore, there there is a sort of a discount. Um, because of those factors. And also, the, as um, in the ESG part, we mentioned that they also issued a 300 million um, ESG-related bond. So I think, and if, if you actually broaden the horizon to looking at 2020 in particular, they, they really outperformed the, the indexes. They performed around 30%, while, while the indexes were around 7 and 2%. So this from April 2020 to April 2021 is, is really a turbulent time um, for them due to the, the reasons described. Uh, maybe to add a bit more to the sponsorship deal. So after the sponsorship was announced, there was a stock 
price drop of around 60%, uh, which was quite a substantial amount. And we can attribute this to the fact that TeamViewer, initially, they were not very transparent with the entire cost structure of the deal, uh, sponsorship deal itself. So investors were very worried about how much uh, the com company would be spending in terms of market, marketing expendi uh, expenditure. So that is another reason for their underperformance. Well, congratulations on your presentation, Bill and Dank. Uh, recently, the company launched a new product called Team Viewer Engage for enterprises. Uh, and I, want to, I wanted to know if, uh, if you have considered this on your valuation or how can this uh, impact your, your numbers? Um, maybe I can kick it off generally. So regarding our target price, we have also incorporated some bit of uncertainty also regarding new products by making use of the Monte Carlo simulation and normally distributing the input variables weighted, namely weighted average cost of capital and terminal growth rate. So with new products developed and these changes regarding these input variables, we have incorporated that in our target price. And even though we see uncertainty regarding these input variables, we still see in the Monte Carlo simulation that above 60% of our target price simulations are above our actual target price. So hence, we believe that our target price is fairly robust, even to not yet fully accounted um, input variables. Yes, and, and adding on to that, the, the product was also a result of the, an acquisition. Um, so it kind of also shows their potential to integrate um, the acquisitions they do into their new products. So in the end, that also shows that for the new, the Zalion and Upskill, the, the, the acquisitions they did, that they will be able to turn them into products that the customers will be able to use um, in the near future. Hence, the revenue growth will, will reflect that. Yeah, and Sufian, maybe if you go to the revenue growth slide again, so we see that we have rather put higher um, revenue growth rates for the, for the time being. Well, it was too far, yeah. For the for the 2025 period, we believe also when um, additionally incorporating the Man United sponsorship deal that these these additional activities will just slowly pay off over time. Uh, yeah, I'm just gonna uh, expand on that uh, acquisition uh, mergers and acquisitions. So um, segment of your presentation. So you know a lot of merger acquisitions in this case are tricky, right? So how do you integrate? What is overlapping? Um, how do you deal with internal um, kind of firm dynamics? So what gives you confidence that these things will work out? What are the risks that, um, that they may not work out well? Maybe I can start things off. Um, referring to what, is, what Sufian said uh, prior, just in the question before, I think uh, what gives us a very good indication is that um, that TeamViewer is able to integrate Ubimax, the first acquisition they made in 2020, already in their power portfolio uh, with, with uh, TeamViewer Engage. And hence, um, we feel like if they are able to do it once, uh, we think there is a high probability that they will um, be very thoughtful with their future acquisitions and hence also with Upsco and, um, and um, Xalium. Um, and what gives us another, or what is another good indicator for us is that their acquisitions are very much uh, focused on future, future markets with high future potential, uh, such as the augmented reality space. Um, so we believe that gives us a very holistic picture, uh, but maybe one of my colleagues can expand on the risks we also see. One thing before the risk, we also have to see that the scale of the acquisitions is, is a lot smaller than what TeamViewer is operating currently. I mean, it operates in, in 180 countries. Um, so, so because of the size differences, it's easier to integrate than if there were more similar companies to, to TeamViewer. And they're also targeting niche products. Um, and as you see from, from their product, um, they have a lot of different products, which they can get the, the network effects um, and the cross-selling that goes on. Hence, it doesn't have to be an integral part of the business. It, it can be a separate product that you can sell with, with cross-selling, for example, which, which substantially reduces the, the risk um, and, and uncertainty with if it's going to be successful or not, because it's not a key integral part. 
I saw on your risk analysis that uh, competition press pressures uh, had high probability and high impact. But regardless of that, you mentioned that this would not imply a downside downside risk for, for the company. Why is that? Um, maybe I can I can start off with this question. So TeamViewer's bottom line may be affected by an increasing competition in the software industry, where firms can try to gain the edge over one another by offering similar products and services at Time. lower prices. Time. Thank you, WHU Otto Beisheim School of Management. At this time, the judges will take a few moments to collect their thoughts before the next university is brought in.